me to John chapter 18. The Gospel of John chapter 18 is where we'll be this morning. Easter is all but upon us. Looking at the calendar, I realized next time, if I'm looking at it right, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Um, and I'm not preaching tonight, and I'm not preaching next Sunday morning because the choir is doing their uh, presentation. So I don't have a lot of preaching opportunities between now and Easter because the sun and the Sunday right after that is Easter. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the events surrounding the the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus uh, tonight. I want to focus on thir- uh, tonight. This morning, this morning I want to focus on Thursday night. A lot of times we focus on Friday, and rightfully so we should, but I want to focus on, on the events in the garden that took place on Thursday night. I'm in John chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I have lost none. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Thursday night. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we just come to you today, God. I'm asking you to please give me what I'm supposed to say and the power to say it, Lord. I, I'm asking you, Lord, to... Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that I might speak in power today, your power. God, I pray that you would guard my mouth, that what I say is just exactly what I'm supposed to say, nothing more and and nothing less, Lord. And God, I pray that you would accomplish your perfect will in each, each heart, each life today. I love you, God, and I, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you had... One day left to live, what would you do? If you knew for certain that you were going to die tomorrow, how would you spend tonight? You say, well, Brother Mark, that's that's kind of a hard question to answer since none of us really know how long we've got. And you're right about that. But I'm struck by the fact that Jesus did know that he was going to die Friday morning. And he spent Thursday night, his last night on this earth, praying. After he shared a meal with his disciples, he went out to the garden and he spent that time praying. And I'm convinced that that is where the battle was decided. If the victory was won on Friday morning on the cross, surely the battle was decided in the garden on Thursday night. By Jesus in the garden, when, when the, this contingent of soldiers, officers from, uh, from the priests and the Pharisees, they come out uh, to arrest Jesus being led by Judas. Jesus makes a series of statements in a conversation with them. Five things he says. And these five sayings of Jesus here in the garden shape the course of eternity. So I just want us to look this morning at these five sayings of Jesus that 
shape the course of eternity. The first thing he says to them as they come out is this, whom are you seeking? Whom are you seeking? So they had struck a deal with Judas that he would lead them to where Jesus was and, and they, he would give them, this was going to be the sign he was going to, the one that he goes up and kisses, that's going to be Jesus, arrest him. And so they, they come out, uh, this, this contingency of, of soldiers, like they're, they're going to uh, arrest some you know, public enemy number one. They come out to arrest Jesus. And Jesus, I, I love this, he goes out to meet them. He doesn't run and hide. He's been in the garden praying. Judas knew the garden. It's interesting that Judas, there was no question about where Jesus would be because Jesus had gone to the garden many times with his disciples to pray. This was common. He didn't wait. Jesus didn't wait until uh, trouble was upon him to start praying. This was a common thing. And so Judas knew immediately, well, I, I can tell you exactly where he's going to be. He's going to be in that garden praying because that's where he goes all the time. And so. Judas leads out this detachment of troops and Jesus doesn't run and hide. <laughs> you know, the, the, later on that night, Peter will, will run and hide and, and deny that he even knows Jesus, but not Jesus. He's been praying. He, he's strong. He's ready to meet the challenge and he goes out to meet the, these soldiers and he asks them this question, Whom are you seeking? Now, if I were going to put that into my own prayer, uh, paraphrase, the way we would say it is this, who are you looking for? <laughs> Jesus just walks right up to them. Here's this whole, it's just Jesus, and here's this whole contingency of soldiers. Knowing that they're going to arrest him, he's going to be tried and crucified the next day, he just walks right up to them. Who are you looking for? And... I think it's interesting that they give the answer. They give the right answer, but for the wrong reason. In verse 5, they answer, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Now that's the right answer. But the reason they're looking for him is, is the wrong reason. There's a lot of people today that are looking for Jesus, but they're looking for the wrong reason. We want, we want Jesus who will come and, and be the genie in the bottle that will, that will uh, bless us financially and heal us when we're sick and put our family back together. But we're not looking for a Savior. We're not looking for someone that will confront us about our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. We're not willing to be confronted with the cross of Good Friday. Let me ask you this. Not only whom are you seeking today? Who are you looking for today? Who did you come to church to find today? But I want to ask you one more. Why do you want to find him? If you tell me I've come to church looking for Jesus, then I want to ask you the next question, and that is, why do you want to find him? Do you want to find him for what... Uh, Blessings you can get out of it. Do you want to find him because uh, it is, you know, the politically correct thing to do in the Bible Belt? Do you want to find him because uh, that's what you know? You think that maybe if you're if you find Jesus, your life will turn around because it's been in the pits lately. That's the wrong reason. If you want to find Jesus, you come to him one way, and that is humbly and repentant. Saying, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner and I know that, that the price of my sin is death and I, I'm not worthy to be one of your children. But by, by your grace, you've called me and, and by my faith, I, I've come. Whom are you seeking today? They say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And then he makes this statement, I am he. Now that's a, that's a very interesting statement. Thing for him to say. If you look at, and I want to point something out to you in your text, if you, if your translation does this, 
I am he, if that's how it translates it out, how many of you the word he is in italics? Okay. What that means when you're when you're reading in your in your translation, in your version, and you see a word in italics, it means that that wasn't part of the original text. It's been supplied in English to help it make sense in English. So that word he really wasn't in the original Greek. Literally what Jesus says, he says, who are you looking for? They say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they are blown back. They draw back and fall to the ground. Is that not an amazing scene? The power of Jesus. Who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. <laughs> In the Greek, it's I go, I me. It's how Jesus starts all of his great I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. All of these start out the same way. I go, I me. Now they come, they come out to the garden to find Jesus. Jesus goes out to meet them and says, Who are you looking for, guys? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. I go, I me. They are literally blown back and fall to the ground in the power of Jesus. What, what a scene here. I am. It's a name for God. It goes all the way back to the days when God meets Moses at the burning bush. He tells him, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, you let my people go. He says, well, God, I don't even know your name. What if they ask me what your name is? Who am I supposed to tell them that sent me? And God says, literally to Moses, I am who I am. You go tell them I am sent you. Now in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew name of God is derived from this verb to be, I am. So, so literally the name of God that, that often gets translated in ways like Jehovah, which that's not a correct translation of it. This is derived from the name I am. Just four letters in the, in the Hebrew language. It transliterates into English Y-H-W-H. There, there was no vowels in the, in the ancient Hebrew language. Scholars don't even know exactly how to pronounce it. The best guess they can come up with is something like Yahweh. It was so holy and so powerful that ancient Jews wouldn't even pronounce it. They wrote the name. They would, they would throw the pen away lest the pen that was written to, to speak, to write, that was used to write such a holy name be used in a profane way. They would, they would dispose of the pen. There's power in the name of Jesus. And I would encourage you, when you're witnessing to somebody, speak the name of Jesus. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. You can sit down and you can talk about church all day long. And nobody gets convicted and nobody will get saved. You can tell them about your church, they'll tell you about theirs. But when you start speaking the name of Jesus, and you start talking about how Jesus Christ loved you, and loved them, and... Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins and your sins and Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and He sits at the right hand of the Father to make intercession and He's coming again one day. Jesus Christ, the soon coming King. One of two things will happen. They'll either ask you to leave or they'll get saved. But they won't stay unchanged because there's power in the name of Jesus. One night, Lisa and I were out on grow. This is, I think we were, uh, well, we were back in Tennessee because we were expecting Landon. She was expecting Landon at the time. We were out making a visit on grow night, and we went to visit this lady. Somebody was telling about us, about, about her. We'd been given a contact, and she's telling us about, about how she's like a practicing witch and uh, she, her, mom, her mother was a fortune teller and she's learned it from her and all this stuff and, 
It's obvious the woman was into a lot of dark, dark stuff. And so we just started witnessing to her. And it was the most amazing thing. And I'm not making this up. Every time you said the name Jesus, the phone would ring. I'm not kidding. And we, we, you know, you start out on the on the plan of salvation, and you'd get to, and you'd say Jesus, and the phone would ring, and she'd have to stop and run and answer it, and it'd be some telemarketer, and then she'd sit back down, and then you'd start again, and about, and then when you got to the name Jesus, phone would ring again, and it'd be a wrong number, and then she'd have to hang up, and we went through about four or five times. Every time the the name Jesus was spoken, the phone would ring. Finally, Lisa told her, says, won't you just leave the phone off the hook? Just take the phone off the hook because whatever somebody's got to tell you, it's not as important as what we're about to tell you. She said, okay, I will. So she took the phone off the hook, started in one more time on the plan of salvation, how we're all sinners. And God loved us and sent His Son, Jesus. And I swear by the time I said Jesus, the door bust open, the back door. Her husband comes in. He looks at us. He looked at me and Lisa and said, y'all are going to have to go. And then he looked at her and said, you're going to have to come with me. He said, there's, there's somebody out in the family cemetery out back, and they're knocking over tombstones. She jumped up and looked at me and said, well, y'all are going to have to go. I ain't got time for this now. And they run off to the cemetery. <laughs> there is power in the name of Jesus. And the demons don't like it. But there's power in it. There, the, the powers of darkness can't stand against it. The soldiers come out to the garden. Jesus goes out to meet them. Ask them a simple question. Who are you looking for? Well, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. I am Jesus of Nazareth. And they're blown back and fall to the ground. They, two truths come out in this little statement to me. First is this, no one took Jesus' life. He laid it down freely. They didn't have the power. He could, he could speak a word and lay them all on their back. Nobody took his life. Second truth I see is this. He is, whether you acknowledge Him or not. Who are you looking for today? Well, I'm looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He is. And He is whether you acknowledge Him or not. The third, the third question that He, the statement that He makes is this. Whom are you seeking? This is in verse 7. It's the same question again. <laughs> now, if I was one of these soldiers, I'd, I'd be getting a little nervous at this point. I go out, I've got a whole contingency with me. We go out to arrest one man, and he's not even armed. He comes out, he doesn't run. We're, we're expecting we're going to have to chase him through the woods. He comes out to meet us, asks, who are you looking for? We, we said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. And we're blown back. Finally, I pick myself back up off the ground, pick my torch up, get my sword strapped back on, and look him back in the eye, and now he wants to ask me that again. Who are you looking for? <laughs> I might have said, I don't know. I think I just changed my mind. <laughs> he asked the same question. Who are you looking for? They say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. To them, he was just a man. Notice they don't say we're looking for the Son of God. We're looking for the Messiah. We're looking for the Savior of the world. All He was was a man. And to most people in the world today, that's all Jesus is, is a man. Just a man. Just a historical figure, a religious leader who died for something he believed in. Just just a man. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Peter says, well, some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say you're John, John the Baptist. Some people say you're, you're a prophet or a teacher. Just a man. 
Yeah, but Peter, the real question is, who do you say that I am? Peter says, well, you're the Christ, Son of the living God. Jesus said, that's the rock I'll build my church on, right there. The real question is not, who does the world say Jesus is today? The real question is, who do you say that Jesus is? To them, he was just a man. What about to Judas? Of all of that took place the last, the last night of Jesus' life, I think the betrayal of Judas hurt him the worst. It's something about when your friends turn against you. You know, some of my worst hurts in life have not come from my enemies. They've come from people that I thought were my friends. Judas followed Jesus around three and a half years. was supposed to be his friend. In the end, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. I knew an evangelist friend that he, had, he preached a sermon on Judas. He called, he called it the man who kissed the door of heaven and didn't get in. Think about that. Jesus, Jesus is the door of heaven. Judas kissed the door of heaven, but didn't get in. Because to Judas, Jesus was a means to an end. A, 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 a political advancement, perhaps. Maybe, maybe he just wasn't, Jesus wasn't the Messiah that Judas was looking for. It wasn't what he had bought into. Judas wanted someone that would throw off the yoke of Rome and, and free Israel militarily and let Judas sit there in the royal court. But Jesus wasn't that kind of king, at least not this time to earth. And now Jesus is talking about humility and sacrifice and even dying. Judas wasn't prepared for all of that. Whom are you seeking? They say, we're, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says to them, well, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. If, if I'm the one you're looking for, let all the rest of these go. And John says that this was uh, to fulfill what he had said earlier in verse 9. Of those whom you gave me, I lost none. So that's the fourth saying, is, I've lost none. Uh, the larger context of this is in Je uh, John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus is speaking, verse 37 of John chapter 6, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. Here's what Jesus is saying. I've come down not to do my own will, but to do the will of the Father. And this is the will of the Father, that I would lay down my life on the cross that whosoever would believe in me might have eternal life. And I would lose none of them, but would raise them up on the last day. You, you want a proof text for the security of the believer? How about that one? I, of all that God has given me, Jesus said, I've lost nothing. Now, in the immediate context, yeah, he's talking about the disciples. But in the larger context, he, he's talking about us. The application is a physical one, but beyond that, it's a spiritual one. It's not just about those 11 men, the 12 minus Judas. It's about us too. Jesus said, I've come to do the will of the Father, and this is the will of the Father, that I would die for sinners like you and me. And that whosoever would believe in me, I wouldn't lose any of them. They would have eternal life and I wouldn't lose any of them. But I'll raise them up on the last day. That's what Easter says. That just as surely as Jesus came out of the ground on Easter Sunday morning, 
we're coming out of the ground. Those of us that trust in Jesus as our Savior, one day he's coming back. And this old body that they plant in the ground one day when I breathe my last breath here on this earth, it's coming out of the ground. Never to die again. The last thing Jesus says is this. Shall I not drink? Verse, now, now here's a, I, I love Peter. Because Peter reminds me of myself. He's very impulsive. Uh, he's quick to talk uh, and quick to act. And then afterwards he's just as sorry as he can be. Which reminds me a whole lot of myself. He, he talks a lot bigger game than what he has. Uh, he, he had already made the statement, I'll never deny you, Jesus. Of course, we know that he did. But here in the moment, I, I'm convinced that Peter is ready to die for, for Jesus. There's a whole contingency of soldiers, armed soldiers, ready to take Jesus. Peter's got a sword. <laughs> Apparently, he had misunderstood something that Jesus had said earlier and went out and got him a sword and strapped it on. So when they come to arrest Jesus, Peter grabs his sword and cuts off the servant's ear. And John even goes so far as to tell us the name of the servant. It's Malchus. Now, you think about this. There's no way Peter could believe that he was going single-handedly or even with the help of the other 11, he was going to take out that whole contingency of soldiers. I believe he was ready to die for Jesus right then. And Peter was going to have an opportunity to die for Jesus, but it wouldn't be with a sword in his hand. It would be crucified upside down a little later on. And, and Jesus tells him, put your sword away. Peter, put, put the sword up. You don't even know what we're doing here. <laughs> I mean, that's my paraphrase. That's pretty much, Peter, you don't even understand what's going on. He's, and then in Matthew 26, we're told that he tells him, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. In other words, that's not how you want your life characterized. A, a, a one of aggression and anger and impulsiveness, Peter. Your life is going to be characterized by humility and submission. Put your sword away. And then he says this, Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? He's talking about the cross here. Now he's already said, he's already said, I, I could call legions of angels to my rescue. He, he's, already, he's already spoken the word and had the, all the soldiers fall to the ground. He didn't need Peter's sword. He could have spoken the word. But he says, Shall I not drink this cup of suffering? He's talking about the cup of suffering in the cross. Now, I think it's interesting that it was in the garden. Remember, Jesus goes to pray, and he goes to pray for strength. And he, goes, he carries his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John. And he tells them, wait here with me, and you pray right here. I'm going to go just a little bit further, and I'm going to pray over there. And he starts praying, and what he prays is this, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. Talking about the cross, the suffering of the cross. He didn't say, I, I want to drink it. He said, Father, if it, all things are possible with you, if this is possible, take this cup of suffering from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. He comes back and he finds his three best friends, Peter, James, and John, asleep. <laughs> he wakes them up. Hey, guys, get up. Pray with me. My, my, my soul is troubled even unto death. He's sweating drops of blood. He's so uh, concerned and, and, and burdened by all of the that's about to transpire. Guys, I need you. If ever I needed my friends, I need them now, he says. Wake up and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he goes away and he prays the same thing again. Father, if at all possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to have to drink this cup of suffering. He comes back again and he finds them asleep again. 
<laughs> Are you sleeping still? Get up. Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat, but I'm praying for you. Now get up and pray. and Pray for me. Pray that, for yourself that you don't enter into temptation. Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. He goes away the third time and he prays again the same thing. Father, I'm asking you, take this cup of suffering from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. He comes back, three best friends. There they are asleep again. He says, are you still sleeping? Well, then sleep on and take your rest. Look, my betrayer's at hand. Judas comes up to him. Hail, master. Kisses him on the cheek. The soldiers come out. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. They're blown back. They pick themselves up off the ground. Who are you looking for? Oh, well, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. If, I, if I'm the one you're looking for, let the rest of these go. Here I am. I'll go with you. Peter pulls out a sword. <laughs> Peter, put that sword up. Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. That's not what I'm about. That's not what you're going to be about either. And he heals the guy's ear. Now, can you imagine being the guy? <laughs> this dude just cut off my ear, and, and this Jesus of Nazareth just put it back together again, and it, it's whole. There's not even a scar there. Put your sword in the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? Interesting that we went from, Father, if at all possible, take this cup of suffering from me to put your sword away, Peter. How can I not drink this cup of suffering that the Father has given me? If the victory was won Friday afternoon on the cross, surely the battle was decided in the crawl, in the garden on Thursday night. What would have happened if Jesus had not drank the cup? There'd be no Easter. We would still be in our sins. Paul says, if Christ be not raised, all hope is lost. But he did drink. He went from that garden to a mock trial and was convicted and crucified the next day. Buried in a tomb. And on the third day, He rose again. And that's what Easter is all about. They say it's darkest just before the dawn. If that's the case, how dark must Thursday night have been? Easter was the brightest morning of all. How dark must Thursday night have been? Yet, out of darkness, the light shone. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is Easter. This is why we celebrate. This is why we sing. Who are you looking for today? And have you found him? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the story of Easter. I thank you for the story of Jesus. And God, now as we come to this time of invitation, I pray that you would touch our hearts with your truth. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us of our sins and our need of a Savior. I pray, Lord, that you'd search our hearts, Lord, and lead us to the decisions that you'd have us to make. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.